I don't know about your family, but my family loves to travel. I think we come by it honestly, though, as our family finds its origins all over the earth. I was born in Guatemala myself, in Central America. My wife, Carla, was born in Minnesota to Finns on both sides of her family, folks who immigrated from Finland just a couple of generations back. And our kids, Dawit and Meheret, are originally from Ethiopia. We often joke that part of what unites our family is coffee. See, coffee, as you may know, is believed to have originated in our kids' homeland of Ethiopia. Guatemala, where I'm from, modestly, produces some of the best coffee in the world. And my wife's people, the Finns, drink the most coffee per capita in the world. Now, don't get alarmed. If you happen to be Norwegian, you come in a close second. In addition to love, of course, coffee and travel, our family is also united in our love of stories. We just can't pass up a good story. So when we travel, all of our passions come together. The ideal basket sumo of family trip or experience involves being in a vehicle heading out somewhere exciting. All four of us with coffees full of mugs, I mean with mugs full of coffee rather. And one of us at least trying to tell a good story. We take turns either making up a story altogether on the spot, trying to retell one we've read or heard, or just seeing what comes to mind. For a couple of years now, when it's my turn to tell a story, I've been making my way through the biblical story, trying to remember and tell it with some exciting kind of retellings of it as much as I'm able. And the kids just love those stories. We kind of keep making our way, and we remember where we've been and what the next story might be, and they help to remember and call out the things we've already covered as we begin to think about what the next part of the story might be like. They love the excitement, the twists and turns that happen in the biblical story. They particularly enjoy being that there is a bit of a sibling rivalry always going on between them, this story of Jacob and Esau. The laugh out loud, they laugh out loud, rather, at the image of Jacob holding on to his brother Esau from birth as they come out. If you've read that story, part of Jacob's name comes from the fact that as these twins are born, Jacob, who, you know, they wrestle to see who's going to come at first, Esau makes it out first, and Jacob comes out holding on to his brother's heel. Quite the grip for a newborn baby. They love to see and imagine themselves in the different personalities of these two brothers. The one who likes the outdoors and his excitement and adventure, and the one who likes the more sedate patterns and rhythms of living in tents. Sometimes when the car trip gets particularly long, my wife and I can relate a little too closely to Rebecca's own feelings about this sibling rivalry. If this is the way it's going to be, says Rebecca, why go on living? And we're all four appalled at the gall and cleverness of Jacob, the trickster, who dupes his very hungry older brother into trading his birthright for a bowl of soup. Mahared says jokingly, now, if it had been a piece of cake, I could understand. But a bowl of soup? About a year ago, when we were in the car, coffee mugs in hand, heading out to Minnesota to visit grandparents, it was my turn to tell the story. And the kids helped remember where we were in the story, and it happened that we were coming to the portion of Isa and Jacob's story that we heard today. Now, as a parent, a responsible parent at that, I kind of had some reservations. I wonder to myself, now, how much editing should I do? How do I tell my kids at the time, seven and ten years old, the story about how the older brother, aided by his mother, duped their aging father into cheating the older brother out of his inheritance? How do I tell 
this story? What is the moral that I could possibly pull out of this? Now, more to the point today, how or what was the people thinking that put together the narrative lectionary when they picked this reading? Didn't they know that it would fall on this very weekend when we do family weekend at Luther College? Didn't they know that this is a time when parents come from all over the place to visit on campus their young, impressionable college students, eager for the chance to provide them with a little checking and some of that very welcomed parental advice. And this is the story the campus pastors get to share with you all? I mean, we haven't even covered half the juicy parts of the story. In what we read, because of time, we missed good portions of it. We didn't hear all of what happens in Genesis 27 and 28. We didn't include the really tragic scene when Isaac, elderly and going blind, realizes what has happened. Or when Isa, the older brother, alternates between promising revenge to kill his brother and begging his father, pleading with him, saying, have you only one blessing, father? Bless me, me also, father. We didn't hear about how Rebecca took advantage of Isaac's anger and tough relationship with Esau's wives to get Jacob out of town and make it look like if it was e Isaac's idea. See, Isaac didn't get along with his Hittite daughters-in-law. They were the locals, Judith and Basemeth, who lived and were originally from the place where they had come to settle. So Rebecca suggests to him that maybe Jacob should, would do better if he went back to their ancestral home to find a wife. Isaac agrees to this, unwittingly allowing Jacob to get out of town before his brother can fulfill his promise of revenge. Lord have mercy. Family weekend indeed. Last Sunday at church in town at First Lutheran, where my family and I are members, my daughter, along with all the third grade class, received a Bible as a gift from the congregation. This Bible now sits right next to her bed, and she has started to read her way through it. Unlike your traditional coffee table family edition, this particular version of the Bible comes with explicit encouragement to write in it, to highlight, to do all kinds of things to mark it up. In fact, it even comes with stickers that can help you mark the important parts. There's a little heart to put in the parts you really love. There's an exclamation mark sticker that can point to those places that you're very excited about. And there's a thought bubble for those that make you wonder. What kind of sticker would my daughter put by the story we read today? As she actually reads the story straight, straight from the Bible, what will she make of it? I mean, reading it from an actual Bible is not like reading it from one of those children's Bible where all those troublesome spots are smoothed away. Maybe the assumption of the congregation, I don't know what they were thinking given third graders' Bibles. Uh, maybe what they were thinking is that the kids would fall victim to the very commonly known syndrome of the little people. I don't know if you're familiar with this seldom, di I mean, often undiagnosed syndrome. The little people sil syndrome gets its name from a song in the musical Les Miserables. I think I'm the only one who gives it the name, but hey, go with me sung by a streetwise kid in the, in the musical Les Miserables, there's a line in the song that goes something like this. I've never read the Bible, but I know that it's true. It only goes to show what little people can do. I've never read the Bible, but I know that it's true. It only goes to show what little people can do. The world and the church are safe, as long as the Bible remains one of the least read bestsellers in the world. Because when we actually read the Bible, we quickly realize that it is not well suited 
for the black and white clear-cut right and wrong role assigned to it by our divisive political and religious culture. On the other hand, when we actually read the Bible, especially when we do it in community, as it was intended to be read, we discovered that it is a very complex and nuanced story. In fact, we discovered that it is that very complexity and nuance that contributes to its stay in power, not only within our faith community, but as a set of stories and convictions that help inform much of the world. This is the way that God, who has inspired this text, speaking through the very life of people, like you and me, has made this text be a part that stays with us. When we actually read the Bible, we find room in it for all kinds of parts of our lives that we are sometimes a little afraid to bring with us to church. We, like my kids, when we're telling stories in the car, can really see ourselves in these stories in these characters that are not two-dimensional Bible heroes, but real complex folk with lives that are at once wonderful and troublesome. When we are willing to really enter into the biblical stories, we can see in them a reflection of our own complex lives, our childhood hopes, but also our grown-up troubles. When we actually read the Bible, we find in it room for our childlike faith with all of its why, why, and find the courage to let go of our childish faith with its unwillingness to grow up. That's certainly the case with today's portion of the biblical story. When we are willing to read and stay with Genesis 27 and 28 in all of its messiness, we are able to pick up hints about the context that led Rebecca to make such troubling choices as she did with Jacob. We see her as a woman who doesn't have a lot of very good choices in a patriarchal society where she has very limited access to any say or power. We find a woman who's constantly trying to figure out how to do the things her husband likes. Three times we are told, such as Jake, such as Isaac likes. Everything in her life had to be done just like such as Isaac likes. How does she get around this capricious husband? Because the trouble is that the man of the house has both literally and figuratively lost his vision. In the language of the story that gets echoed later, when we are introducing 1 Samuel to Eli, who also has grown old and lost his vision, the Bible hints at the fact that just like Eli will later, Isaac doesn't have a vision that goes much farther than his own interest, perhaps his own belly. We quickly realize that Isaac doesn't quite get the complexity of what's before him. So Rebecca has to find a way without a lot of power and authority to work her way around him. Because part of what she knows that Isaac doesn't seem to see is that their second-born Jacob is better suited for the job of family leader than the impulsive first-born Esau. Rebecca has to find a way to work around this and work around an entire tradition that says that the firstborn ought to receive the inheritance of everything. She also knows that even though that's what the law says, it never happens that way. She knows what happened with Cain and Abel. That didn't end up so well. She knows what her own husband Isaac And his relationship with his older brother Ishmael was like. And that also didn't turn out so well. So Rebecca has to find a way 
around all of these different systems in place so that she can figure out a way to protect the family blessing, to think beyond the immediate, and to challenge some of the things she finds. Even though her decisions, she knows, will have dire consequences if they don't work out. Now, such a reading of this text can leave us wondering, where is God in this story? Where is God? That happens to be the exact question troubling Jacob as he tries to fall asleep on his first night of exile. Jacob have, has crossed the line. Figuratively, he's gone beyond the boundaries of what he should. He has cheated his brother. He has lied to and deceived his father. But he has also now crossed an actual physical line. You notice in the story that he is just on the other side of the river. That's the river that marks the boundary of the promised land. That's the river that in his imagination marks the boundary of where God is. And he is now just over it, far enough from it, feeling the need to step outside the lines. And as he tries to fall asleep in what must have been a quite a troubling night, we're given this image that he has nothing but a stone for a pillow and his troubling questions for a blanket. Where is God? And that's when it happens. A vision of angels going up and down, connecting the heavens with the messiness of the world, opening a pathway between the two. That's when it happens. After all the messiness of it, that Jacob wakes up in a start and says, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. If we are willing to join Jacob and his story, his troubling questions, we may also join him in his surprising discovery. Where is God in the story? where we least expect God. Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. In an interview published earlier this week with Pope Francis, he spoke about the centrality of surprise in our relationship with God. He said, if a person says that he met God with total certainty, and is not touched by a margin of uncertainty, then this is not good. For me, says the Pope, this is an important key. If one has the answers to all the questions, that is the proof that God is not with him. It means that he is a false prophet using religion for himself. The great leaders of the people of God, like Moses, have always left room for doubt. You must leave room for the Lord, not for our, cert for our certainty. Is there room in our reading of Scripture for God? Is there room for us to be surprised by where God shows up? Is there room to see God in our own and the world's difficult stories? Stories of abuse, of broken relationships, of addiction, of disappointment, of violence. Is there room in our reading of the Bible to see the, si the, sibling, the sibling rivalry within families and among nations? Is there room for our stories with no easy answers? Is there room for stories that do not fit neatly into our aspirations, where the characters don't come off so well and certainly are not guaranteed to have happily ever after lives? In our conversations about our complex family stories, we modeled in the honesty and complexity of the biblical story. Can the church be the place 
where we learn to read Scripture and our lives this way. It's the place that articulates our highest hopes and our greatest aspirations with conviction, but also the place that recognizes our limitations and the difficult choices we must sometimes make, where we can say, filled with unexpected surprise and unearned grace, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I didn't know it. This is the call to the church that Pope Francis issued later on in that interview I mentioned, published on Thursday. A part of the interview that didn't go over so well and sent ripples throughout the religious world, not only his own tradition, but many others as well. Pope Francis, sounding very much like this troublesome biblical story, said the following. God is in every person's life. God is in everyone's life. Even if the life of a person has been a disaster, even if it is destroyed by vices, drugs, or anything else, God is in this person's life. You can, you must try to see God in every human life. Although the life of a person is a land full of thorns and weeds, there is always space in which the good seed can grow. You have to trust God. Complex family stories like those of Isaac, Rebecca, Isa, and Jacob have the power to hold my children's imagination as we speed down the highway in the car and keep them entertained for a few hours. In sharing these stories with them, I do have to exercise some parental editing and advice. But I also strive to honor the nuance and the troubling elements of these stories. I want them to know when they no longer think I know everything, that I am also not all that naive. I want them to know that when their choices do not reflect my highest aspirations for them, that there is still room for complexity in my love for them. Most importantly, I want them to know that there is room in the church, in the scriptures, in the love of God, to find God in surprising, unexpected places, even when we have crossed the lines we have set for ourselves. I want them to know that these stories that now find their very dangerous way next to my daughter's bed, I want them to know that these stories will grow with them. Just as these are stories they can grow through.